getting into Jeremiah and some of these historic things. Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, wasn't it 10 chapter to talk about a, a tree when it's planted and decorated with ornaments? And I'm thinking that these pagan customs are coming in and I need to deal with something. And then you sit back and you think about it and you ask yourself how many pagan customs we are um, submitting ourselves to. Um, whether it be a Christmas tree, which is just a slight element, or laying flowers on a grave. See, you don't know, but if we start to look at the origin of things, you'll be surprised to know how many things we do on a daily basis. A funeral service, the way it's conducted. Um, a marriage ceremony, dressed in white, you know, like the kind of paraphernalia that goes with that. A bride looks like a bride, and all of this thing that comes, and then you throw rice and flowers and old shoes. Wedding band. You need brothers that are married need to wear a wedding band. Isn't that what's, that's a principle? Even this wedding band that I wear is pagan in its origin. It's not scripture. The shape of the church, it's pagan going back into apostate religion. And so when we start to really check paganism, we can pick on one or pick on the other, but God, there's no end to it. And so I decided not a word to write anything about it. Uh, we just need to promote godliness. And pray that God help you that you don't follow the beast. Because we are heading into that period of time where the world is already wandering after the beast. You see, we read, we read years ago when the prophecy were, was, was given that the world wandered after the beast. That's fulfilled a long time. And not only the world, beautiful scripture, maybe... Well, before we go there, um, um, I don't know if I really want to get... Let me let me go there. Leave, leave Job for a little bit here. And let's come back just for a little bit in Revelation, the 13th chapter. And <clears throat> this, this talk that I'm giving you tonight is, is based on what we have been taught... But Dan is right. We are building on a foundation that was already given to us. So who give us the foundation that we're standing on? See? Um, Brother Goodwin was my teacher. He changed my theology in a lot of areas. My doctrine was changed in a lot of areas. And I'm glad I met him. Really shook up my old false doctrine concepts. Whether it was moving out a live soul or literal burning hell or the Trinity doctrine or the kingdom of God. A reality that God would be established and not some heavenly paradise that you shine stars for the rest of your life. He really shook up my, my theology and taught me a lot of things that I, I know so like the Apostle Paul says, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Not only the apostles, but the prophets. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You know, one day I was leaving um, Brother Brintley's convention, his meeting that he had, and the Sunday afternoon uh, we were heading out. Uh, we were we drove back on Sunday afternoon, right, to Rochester, and so we were heading out. And while I was on my way out there, I met Brother Waters. I've mentioned this to you already sometime. And Brother Waters, he already had his dinner. I just had mine, and I was heading out. And he stopped me, and he had a few things to talk to me, so a few good things um, to say to me. But among those things that he said to me, 
Um, I, I mentioned to him, I said, Brother, Brother Waters, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's what I told him, right? Because whatever he was saying, I was just sharing, you know, joining together with him on the thought. And then he looked at me. He says, you know, a house has a foundation. And ever so often, the unbalance of the building or whatever he was telling me, that foundation gets cracked, you know, Brother Singh. And sometimes... It gets so bad that water comes in the foundation. So foundation needs to be maintained. And you know, a few people, Brother Vid said he started hearing people talk, me too. Um, the worst thing you can do is for me to sit there and hear you yap, 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 especially if you're a woman. And you keep talking, 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 talking. It really aggravates me. I mean, thank God for speech. But sometimes I wish humanity had remote controls that I could mute you. Because a lot of times we talk until there's no more sense to what we say. Well, we're human beings and we like to talk. When I was small, they called me mouth manager because I used to talk. I mean, I used to talk and get in trouble with the school teachers and all of that. But you come to the place in life that you don't like to hear people talk empty talk. Just talk empty talk. And you can develop the ability to shut your ears off while it's still open. And you can have 500 people around you, but you don't have to listen to every voice. And it is good because a man is judged by what comes out of him. That's what Jesus said. And so when Brother Waters told me that a foundation sometimes get cracked, we can say, and it's easy for us to say this, that we are built upon the, upon, uh, apostle, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Well, what do you mean? We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and Jesus being the chief cornerstone. What do you mean? The teachings of the apostles? You mean this is what they all taught? You mean this is all they taught? All right. Paul has more of the epistles. Most of the New Testament was written by Paul. Is that what he was really teaching the church? Make a guess. No. Those letters were written to churches. Most of them were backsliding when Paul was trying to salvage them. What built those churches was a whole lot of messages that we have not recorded. And the New Testament church, I like that statement I heard years ago. Uh, the New Testament church did not have a New Testament. There was no New Testament. So man that was called of God had to be really called of God. Because otherwise he'd stand up there and say, Oh, 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 I don't have anything to say. But see, we got somebody else's message to talk about. And when we say we are built upon the foundation of the apostles, I hope that we are. I hope if Paul comes, he wouldn't say, what you all are teaching? I hope if Paul just resurrects from the dead and he comes in here and says, this is a Gentile church, God, you all do look like Gentiles. I wonder if Paul gets resurrected from the dead and he comes and he, he listens to the way we preach and the way we carry on and we've got our band and we've got our music and the people are all here and we've got good air condition and heating facilities and fancy automobiles and all this <laughs> paraphernalia. I wonder if Paul would wonder if we are a part of Rome. Because what they did was a whole lot different than what we are doing today. 
So I don't have what Paul used to build his church. I don't. Uh, when he did the messages he used to build Corinth, we don't have it. Now I'm saying tonight I've never said before. The messages that Paul used to build the churches of Galatia, there were four there. You remember them? You in the congregation, help me out here. One, one, one person give me one at a time. Antioch. Lystra, thank you. No, no, no. One person give me one church. S spread it around. Antioch. Lystra. Derby. Iconium. Sounds right. All right? So the four churches that Paul had in Galatia alone. We don't have the messages he used to build that church. We don't even know how he conducted services. What about Colossae? We read a little in the book of Acts how these things, these churches got started and how he made journeys. But we do not have the messages these apostles preached in those churches to build them up, do we? If you do, I'd love to have them, but I don't. I have his corrective letters, and what we are trying to build our churches on are corrective letters. It's like putting up a fence. Paul put up a fence, uh, uh, 500 yards of fence, and we got two pickets, and we're trying to put up a fence like Paul. And what we need, and you see, it's amazing that Paul wrote these things, and some of the letters are missing, and some of the letters are lost, and individuals that got some of Paul's writing, they twisted the writings of Paul to build their own little fancy church. So when I say I'm standing on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief God, that's a big statement. It's bigger than I can even imagine, and I should not be naive to the fact that I don't know how he built those churches. But you see, Brother Fed, when he spoke here today, and Brother Dan too, tonight... The thing is, sometimes you get discouraged and sometimes you wonder, you know, God help us here. You know, I read the news the other day when this drunk man, this drunk driver killed a grandfather and his three grandkids. And you wonder when a mom and dad is home and listen to that, what happens? And someone loses their child and it's mutilated. I went on Facebook the other day and one of the girls put a mutilated baby in blood. I took it off my face. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see, you know, like what, what, sometimes Facebook can be so obnoxious. You don't want to see that. You don't want to see the obnoxiousness. But guess what? It's real. And we're here today, and we can talk big, and we can say how great we are, but you're not going to live forever. You will die. See, I'm standing in Job's shoe, just for a little bit. And I told the Lord, every day I tell the Lord, Lord, we need some more money. I tell him every day, Lord, we need some more money. Can you please give him the Holy Ghost? When I come down to pray, you know, like when we have our Thursday prayer meeting, that's my spot. You're not like that spot there. See that spot? When I'm dead and gone, you come alone in the church. <laughs> that's my spot. What do you think I'm doing? I come there, and when I cry, I have to blow my nose, and my nose run, my eyes run, and everything runs. Somebody says, what is he doing? He's blowing his nose all the time. You know what I'm asking, God? I need your Holy Ghost more in my life. I don't need the wealth and the prosperity of the ungodly. I need more of the Holy Ghost. If we get a real dose of the Holy Ghost, we will know what Paul built his church on. <laughs> But if we fake that experience, we're really a bunch of fakes. And that is why we need to understand 
how serious it is to depend on God to help us. And you get discouraged sometimes. You think you want to see more things happen. And I see Brother Ved made some good statements here tonight when he was talking. He, uh, he said that, you know, Brother Singh gets up here and he preaches the word and we need the Holy Ghost there. Right? Well, you know, <clears throat> when he was saying that, I'm thinking of Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Full of the Holy Ghost. He returned from the wilderness full. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He comes out full of the Holy Ghost. Stands in the synagogue. Opened the book of Isaiah. And that's the only time I ever heard him open something and read from it. So he opened the book of Isaiah and said, Listen to all of this. And when he says about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, This day is it fulfilled in your ears. And he sat down. And everybody's looking at him. Because the greatest enemies to missions are prejudice and indifference, with ignorance being the mother of both. Can a prophet be accepted in his own country? You know what? Destroy the people back there. They knew Jesus as an ordinary person. They didn't see him as Lord Jesus. Hindsight is always 2020 vision. See, you and I, let me stop picking on us. The children of Israel today in the promised land. You know they love Moses? Yes, they do. The children in the promised land today. I mean, not promised land, in Israel today. Sorry. That's, thank you, Brother John. <laughs> the children of God in Israel today, they love Moses. But the ones that met Moses and were under him didn't love him. We always love somebody long distance. Or in the past. But when someone is there and he's ordinary and he's telling you about your sin and your wickedness and how to turn to God, we don't love them. You always love somebody else in some other church. We do. Now they're hitting their head on the wall, loving Moses, but their fathers killed the prophets. We've got to watch our spirit because when Jesus stood there as the most anointed individual and he was finished reading that scripture, he sat down and they looked at him and he was very soft. You know, I, I with gracious words, isn't that what the scripture says? With gracious words, he taught them. He would say, you know, brothers and sisters, very soft, sweet spoken. He says, I'm here to let you know. That God loves you. I don't know what he said. I'm just making up some stuff here. That God loves you. And God wants to save you. And I'm here. I'm, and God's a servant. I'm here. Uh, and I'm here to uh, unshackle your burdens. Can you imagine there's a big convention and the spirit just moved like we say it is. Like the spirit just moved. Sat down. And I get up, or somebody get up, forget me. Somebody gets up that's really real, that God sent. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, Sharon. Um, I know you're having good religion. You offer burnt offerings and sacrifices and fat of uh, fed beast and all of that. And you give a lot in the offering and all of that. But you know what? I want you to know that God looks at you and he sees the rulers are the rulers of Sodom and he sees you people here as the people of Gomorrah. You're a bunch of sinners that you need to repent. How many people will accept what he says? No bolts come, lightning bolts coming out of his hand. No, no, no. He's just ordinary. He's not working Signs and one, no, 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 he's just ordinary. That's what Isaiah was, ordinary man. I never read that Isaiah did one miracle. And Isaiah comes and gives them the message. And that's what Jesus did. I think with gracious words he taught the people. And in spite of his anointing, your anointing does not save the non-elect. 
everyone sitting in that congregation that day was non-elect. And they all wanted to kill him. And they all got together. Was he fighting them? No. But they got him, took him out to push him over the edge of the hill. <laughs> he couldn't be more anointed. You see, when people jump up and scream and people say, he's anointed, whoever says that is an idiot, and the person that's trying to create that impression is an idiot. Anointing is not how loud you scream. Come on, we are Pentecostals and we got so much of religion in us that we fail to see the fact Jesus was the most anointed and I don't think he even lifted his voice one time unless he was rebuking the devil. See, anointing is not what you think it is. And why I like this service tonight is because we sang the whole, all the choruses sitting. And I'm watching to see if any rebel is going to jump up and let their emotions lead them up in front while the rest of us are sitting. You know when you do that, it's not good. If you feel like you need to repent, you do that. But if you feel like you need to lead everybody out in here and but Singh does not know what's going on and you know more than he does, you're not smart. Right. We'll stand up so you don't get embarrassed. But a lot of times, I'll sit there and not move. Because tonight was an opportunity for us to sing. And there was a good, good spirit, good atmosphere. I love what we were doing here. There was a lively, good atmosphere. But I said, let's sit. Let's learn how not to be controlled by our feelings. The spirit of God was on Jesus. Anointing was on him. And Israel did not accept him. You know, after that incident, he left, and you know the story. He went, cast the, about, a, in that same chapter, he went further on to cast the demon out. And the demon said, I know who you are. You're Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The devil was smarter than the people in the synagogue. I hope that's not the same thing happening today. Is it possible? Yes, it is. So when I say I'm built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, am I really? We're supposed to be built. Well, you see, unless we have the genuine Holy Ghost with the loss, and that is something about Jesus, he never wrote a single letter to anybody. And yet, things are written about him. And you know, what we're doing here is we're hoping that God really helps us. And when I think of all the tragedies and all the negatives and how many people we pray for and they're not getting healed, but it can discourage you. But there's another side, a flip side of that, that encourages you. Because when you stand up and God touches your mind, you know, God's real. Guess what? He's real. When you could die and God save you in the midst of something that almost should kill you, God's real. Amen. When you see the scriptures coming to pass and being fulfilled in our days like we said it was 20, 30 years ago, God's real. This book might have flaws, might have mistakes, but there are things in here that are genuine and, and, and amazing. And it's an amazing religion we're involved in. <clears throat> Let's not corrupt it by our lack of communication with God. Let me fast quickly look at this scripture in Revelation chapter 13. And if our teachings are right, and the beast is representing civil government, if we're right, I really believe we are, but I said if, because there is a final approval from Jesus that he must do these scriptures. If we're right, and this beast here is civil government, the woman that rides the beast is the spirit of religion and the spirit of an ungodly society. All right? And it says here, uh, John saw this beast, and he says, I saw one of the heads, verse 3, as it was wounded to death. 
And then his deadly wound was healed. And if we believe that that's Roman Catholicism, that was wounded during the pro Protestant Re Reformation by Martin Luther and the Reformers, and the deadly wound is healed. We are seeing, we're living in that time where the deadly wound is being healed. Didn't we tell you it would? Yes. If you've been in this church 30 years, you would know we've been saying that. Yes. While well, it's coming to pass. All right? And it says, and all the world. How many? All. Do what? Wondered. Not W-A-N. W-O-M-D-E-R-E-D. -E -E they were amazed at what the beast can do. I got me a new iPhone. Got me a new iPhone. And you know those crooks that work in these different departments? They can really mess you up when you get in there. They'll give you an offer and then suddenly it changes. Well, then I don't want the offer. Anyways, make a long story short. 64 gigabytes in one iPhone. When I came to Canada in 1980, it would take that room full of computers almost <laughs> to handle what that little iPhone can handle today. If we're to use, if we're to use literal books to contain information, it would take a vast library to contain what the iPhone can contain. Amazing marvel, isn't it? We all appreciate it, don't we? The ungodly made it. And we've got to come to the place of being able to use this world but not get carried away with it because we're living here. See, Paul says use this world but not abuse it. As a child of God, you must be directed by the Word of God in all the things you do. Whether it's Christmas or Easter, whether it's iPhone or any other technology, whether it's school or college or university, always put God in priority. Nothing beats when nothing beats it when a church has a smart child graduating out of university. I was so proud of Tara when she was graduating. I wanted everybody to know that that was my niece. Any, were you proud? When you hear, when you hear one, you hear like somebody's getting two honors and three honors and, you know, like this little things. You said, oh, uh, but her name is Paranganel, so it goes all the way down to the last. And when they call, and she walked away, and there was one girl that did better than you. She got more. And you know, when you hear like good reports, it makes you proud. Wouldn't that be nice that somebody becomes a doctor in this church? <coughs> Mercy, you listen to me? Wouldn't that be nice that somebody become a doctor in this church? Wouldn't that be nice that somebody is a, is a qualified lawyer in this church? Are we all just going to change pampers and diapers and, you know, that's it? Come on! The world has things that you and I can take, bring together, and utilize for the kingdom of God. And here it says, all the world wandered after the beast, but without knowing it, when they're giving the beast more credit than they give God, they worship the dragon that give power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war? Nobody can take this government down. Nobody can take away technology. Nobody can bring this all to an end. Guess what? The Tower of Babel is being built in our day, and God will cause it to collapse. Amen. You and I, for us to build on, we need to stand on the foundation that God has given us today, that the foundation that has been planted in our hearts. You see, it's nice to know that the church started on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. But the apostles and prophets are gone, but Jesus is still alive. Amen. And Paul said to the church at Corinth, I have laid the foundation. 
It was completely different than some of the apostles' foundation because they were dealing with the Jews. Paul was running to the Gentiles. And this church has had a good foundation laid. Don't move away from it. Amen. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. 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 And when you, wander away, when you wander after the world and you worship this beast, you indirectly worship the dragon who is the devil that gives power unto the beast. Let's use this world, but not abuse it. Let's live here and don't let the fashions and style motivate us to go contrary to God. You know what I like? Jesus is a simple Jesus. And I like people that can maintain simplicity. Amen. Tara, I'm so proud of you. And I wish you'd be here more in church. Because, you see that kid? She is so smart and educated. But it doesn't fly to her head. See her brother Gary? She's so smart. Her dad told me that. He says there are things that she knows that he does not even dream of learning. And it does not fly to her head. Wouldn't that be nice if all of us in this building get to that place? Where our service becomes, keep, we keep it simple. And we completely dedicate ourselves to God. Amen. Think Daniel was an idiot? No, he wasn't. You think Paul was an idiot? No, he wasn't. See, God chose men. Think Moses was an idiot? No, he wasn't. But they treated him like one because getting old and he became calm and meek and people took advantage. Listen, don't let prejudice destroy you from submitting yourself to the word of God that you're receiving in this assembly. Nice talking to you tonight. Uh, tomorrow we want to look far, far great. Um, here in the book of Job, just, just turn to Job and I'll talk to you a little bit here and then if we need the scripture, I'll, I'll let us look at it. Um, Early this morning, I got up and I don't know what motivated me to want to deal with paganism. And I said, I'm going to start dealing with paganism. And, you know, sometimes you get on the internet and you're a little bit disappointed with the way our churches and our ministers and are carrying on and when you look at pictures of what's going on around the world you wonder if we are really losing it you know from we just came through the Christmas season and so I sat there and I thought about it and I said Christmas Christmas trees mangers little figurines are set up and I really wanted to put a little thing together on the origin of the Christmas tree, you know, getting into Jeremiah and some of these historic things. Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, wasn't it 10th chapter that talked about a, a tree when it's planted and decorated with ornaments? And I'm thinking that these pagan customs are coming in, and I need to deal with something. And then you sit back and you think about it and you ask yourself how many pagan customs we are um, submitting ourselves to. Um, whether it be a Christmas tree, which is just a slight element, or laying flowers on a grave. So you don't know, but if we start to look at the origin of things, you'll be surprised to know how many things we do on a daily basis. A funeral service, the way it's conducted. Um, a marriage ceremony, dressed in white, you know, like the kind of paraphernalia that goes with that. A bride looks like a bride, and all of this thing that comes, and then you throw rice and flowers and old shoes wedding band you need brothers that are married need to wear a wedding band 
Isn't that what's, uh, that's a principle? Even this wedding band that I wear is pagan in its origin. It's not scripture. The shape of the church, it's pagan going back into apostate religion. And so when we start to really check paganism, we can pick on one or pick on the other, but God, there's no end to it. And so I decided not a word to write anything about it. Uh, we just need to promote godliness and pray that God help you that you don't follow the beast because we are heading into that period of time where the world is already wandering after the beast. You see, we read, we read years ago when the prophecy were, was, was given that the world wandered after the beast. That's fulfilled a long time. And not only the world, beautiful scripture, maybe uh, before we go there, um, um, I don't know if I really want to get, let me, let me go there, leave, leave Job for a little bit here, and let's come back just for a little bit in Revelation, the 13th chapter. And <clears throat> this, this talk that I'm giving you tonight is, is, Based on what we have been taught, but Dan is right, we are building on a foundation that was already given to us. So who give us?